When we talk about the, um, about the will of God, there are things that God permits, obviously, that are not uh, the things that He um, desires to happen. Many of them. Uh, a lady asked me this morning, she'd been reading through the Old Testament and asked me about uh, men like Abraham and uh, Isaac and Jacob and David and so on. These men had a plurality of wives. And uh, since the Bible is very clear from the very beginning to the end that God's plan is one husband and one wife, and uh, how then would God use men like uh, the men I mentioned since they had uh, these plurality of wives? What we have to understand is, I guess in that lesson, is that God demonstrates great mercy. And uh, we need to understand that God gets his sovereign will done in spite of man not because of man. God's will is going to be done. There's also such a thing as, as a culture, a different uh, standards and different uh, expectations and things that are acceptable. Uh, they may not be in God's uh, perfect will or direct will, but God will permit them. Now let me give you an example, okay? I believe the Bible teaches that a Christian, once he gets saved, she gets saved, he or she gets saved, that they ought to get baptized in water as a public testimony picture to others that they themselves died with Jesus Christ and was buried with Jesus and rose again. Okay? Now I believe that's why we baptize in water. Now I believe if I take <coughs> some water and do this. It does not picture that truth. That's right. That's right. Now, okay? Now, every Presbyterian does this. Right? All that I know. Every Methodist does this. Right? Every Lutheran does this, right? That's right. Now, it does not picture, it doesn't, I don't think it follows any New Testament scripture on water baptism. But do you think that God is so bound that unless a man baptizes in water that God can't use that man and won't use him? No way. Uh, no way. Martin Luther never was baptized scripturally. <laughs> but God just seemed to turn a death, uh, you know, turned away and forgot it, didn't pay any attention to it. James Kennedy, who pastors the Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in uh, Florida, what's the town? Um, anyway, down in Florida. Uh, they have about 5,000 people every Sunday morning. He is a Bible preacher. They have 500 people a week out on visitation trying to win people to Christ. I don't know of a Baptist church in the country that does any better than that. Do you? But do you know that guy is a five-point Calvinist and sprinkles babies? I don't know how God could bless him. He's not even a Baptist. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> I think God's, you know. But anyway, so my point is this. God has, um, God has a way that he wants to do things, not only in the world, but in your life. There is a best way. There's a best way. But if he can't find men and women who will do it the best way, I promise you, he'll use an inferior individual who is not doing it the best way, and still get more done with an individual who's doing it the best, who knows the best way, but won't do it. In, in other words, don't you think God's more pleased with a Presbyterian who sprinkles babies and goes soul winning and gets people saved than he is a Baptist who's got it all together and never witness? Amen. I mean, do you think that just because we cross the T and dot the I uh, the correct way as we see it, you think that the, that is what God's concerned about? Not primarily. Not really. Not really. So when we talk about the will of God, uh, we're not just talking about something that centers around your life and my life. God has a will that encompasses all of creation and all the universe. And he has a purpose. And then there are things that he wills to be done.
to bring about that purpose. And I can tell you that God's purpose is going to be accomplished. Now, God's will for your life may not be accomplished. But God's overall will for creation and for His Son is going to be accomplished. But God's will for your life may not be accomplished. Because you have to cooperate. See, there are some things in the Bible that are conditional. And there are some things that are unconditional. Now, the conditional things depend on men and angels. The unconditional things are going to be done regardless of how you respond. In other words, nothing could have stopped the birth, the virgin birth of the Son of God. Amen. I mean, God was going to bring that about and He brought it about, right? right. Nothing could have kept Jesus Christ in the tomb. Not one thing. Nothing. See, nothing could stop it. Nothing can stop the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's nothing going to stop it. The church, folks say, well, if the church just gets the gospel out to all the world and the church... No, nothing is going to stop the return of Christ. He's coming. Nothing is going to stop Israel becoming the nation where the center of the kingdom of this earth is going to be. Nothing. The United Nations, a world government, and if the world government unites with all the demons of hell, they will not stop it. Right. Matter of fact, they do unite with all the demons of hell. Yeah. They can't stop it. There are things that are unconditional. They are going to be done. For instance, if you die unsaved, there is nothing that will keep you out of hell. Nothing. That's right. Not your mother. Not your daddy, not your church, not your works, not your giving to charity, not your good intentions. There is nothing that will keep you out of hell if you die without Jesus Christ. Right, right, right. And if you truly get born again and trust Jesus as your Savior, there is nothing that will keep you out of heaven. Amen. Nothing, nothing. So there are some things that are unconditional. But boy, there are a lot of things that are conditional too. And there are a lot of things that, that a child of God needs to understand. If he, is, he or she is going to be, uh, and have, be in the will of God and have God's will for his life while he's in this sojourn down here on this little uh, dot in space called earth. Okay. Now, let me just tell you some things that I know are the will of God. There are many things I don't know. Somebody comes to me and says, Pastor Blue, I've been praying about marrying this guy, and I just want to know if you think it's God's will. I probably can't tell you. If the guy's not saved, I can tell you it's not God's will. But beyond that, I can't tell you much. Somebody, I, I know there are preachers that they think they know God's will for everybody. They, they know what kind of car they ought to have, and they know what kind of house they ought to have, and what color it ought to be painted, and... They know how they ought to dress, and they know how they ought to cut their hair, and they know where they ought to go for entertainment. They know everything about everybody. I mean, they need to know God's will. Matter of fact, you don't even need God if you got them around. Amen. Right? No, really. You don't, don't go to God. Just come to me, and I'll tell you what to do. You say. Amen. I'll tell you who to date and who not to date and how often to date them and what to buy and what not to buy and where to go and what not to go and what to eat and what not to eat and how to cut you. You know, I mean, good night. Who needs a God with that? Yeah. Say. Now, I must confess, I don't know those things. And so I stay out of that. Right. I had a guy to come to me one time. He said to me, Pastor Blue, he says, my wife wears these britches, these pants, you know, they, you know, and I want her to be feminine. I don't want her to look like a man. And he says, would you tell my wife not to wear pants? I said, are you crazy in any other area? I'm not telling your wife anything. <laughs> You know what that guy was trying to do? He was trying to get me killed. <laughs> Would you tell my wife? Well, I'm not going to tell her anything. I'm not going to tell her anything. First of all, she's got a husband. Well, she did. that gal didn't have a husband, but most women do <laughs> that are married. But anyway, first of all, she's got a husband. Right? Secondly, she's got the Holy Spirit if she's saved. Don't you think the Holy Spirit could work through the husband and the husband and the Holy Spirit could kind of work that thing out? Same. And uh, I had another guy came by here. He, <laughs> he's kind of cute. He came by here, and he came up to me, and we were, went up to the... We used to have a little coffee thing upstairs after church. Now downstairs, by the way, after the service is some coffee and refreshments. And you're welcome to go down there after the service this morning. But we were meeting... We'd go upstairs, and this guy came right up to me. 
and uh, he just got out of the Navy, and he came up to me, and he said, uh, well, Reverend, he said, uh, I want to know what your standard for your women in your church, your standards are. I said, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I don't have any women in my church. Well, he said, your ladies. I said, I don't have any, <laughs> I don't have any ladies. I have a wife and a daughter and some daughter-in-laws and some granddaughters, but I don't have any ladies in my church. And he got frustrated because I knew what he meant, and he knew I knew what he meant, but I wasn't going to play his game. And uh, he wanted to, he's a little short guy, big bushy mustache, and uh, he wanted to know what the standard for the ladies was. I said, I, I, I didn't say this. I wanted to say it. I said, you know, I wanted to say, you know, I really don't focus on standards for ladies, but we don't let our men wear mustaches. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I didn't say it. And I wanted to say it for his sake. And you know what that guy was wanting? That guy had, that guy had some kind of wild harebrained idea that God, God's will uh, is that the church would whip people into some kind of conformity on how they dress and what they eat, and etc. And this guy was a wimp. And he wanted me to enforce what he didn't have the courage to enforce. Now, folks, it's not my job to enforce those things. God the Holy Spirit is able and capable and willing to show you these things if your heart's right with him. Amen. And if your heart's not right, I couldn't do anything for you anyway. That's right. You know, there's one thing I can't do. I cannot give you character and I can't give you spirituality. I can give you information. But I can't give you spirituality. I can't make you spiritual. I can't make you have fellowship with God. You'd like to hold me accountable and say, well, that's why I don't feel close to God. It must be Pastor Blue. No, 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 no. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's not my fault. It's not your wife's fault either. And nor your husband's. Nor your parents. It's yours. You are as close to God today as you want to be. You say, oh, I'm not. Then move a little closer. All you got to do is move closer. Draw nigh to God, and what does this say? He'll draw nigh to you. God is the great responder. God is the great responder. He said, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. Stand right over there, would you please? Every time I take a step, I want you to take one, okay? God says, draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. So I take a step to God, and look at there. Take another one. Look at there. That's about as close as I want to get to him. But anyway. <laughs> okay. But that's the way it works. <laughs> that's the way it works. You want to get closer to God? Then you move. You move. See? You move. And I, you know what? I know you folks. Some of you worry me. You really do. I'm concerned about you. You know what I've been watching you do? You have been doing this. I've been watching you. You're taking little baby steps. But I'm watching you. I'm watching you. I'm watching you. I'll tell you, somebody else is watching you more than I am. Same. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. So I can know some things about the will of God for you. But there are many things I can't know. I can't know. I don't know where God wants you to go to Bible college. I don't know what subjects God wants you to study. I can give you some advice, but I can't say this is God's will. I don't know that. Nobody else knows it. It's God's will if you're a child that you obey your parents. That's God's will. It's God's will if you're a wife that you reverence your husband. That'll get that feminist crowd, won't it? It is God's will. Whether you do it or not, it's still God's will. Right? Sure, yeah. Husbands, it's God's will that you love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's God's will. I know that. Now, how you go about all that, I, that's your business. But I do know that those things are God's will. But let me tell you three or four things here that I do know that's God's will. I know one that is God's will that men and women should be saved. I know it's God's will that you get saved. I do not buy into Calvinism that's God's, it's, that some people are elected to be saved and some people are predestined to go to hell. The Bible does not teach that people are predestined to go to hell. God wants you to be saved. 
and I could just show you that repeatedly. For instance, let's go to 2 Peter. Go to the right there of Ephesians, and I'm just going to look at one verse because of our time. But uh, good night, there are scores of verses that teach this. Look at uh, 1 Peter, <clears throat> or 2 Peter, uh, chapter 3, and look at verse 9, 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. For look at it, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I know that God is not willing that any should perish. I know God doesn't want any man, woman, boy, or girl to miss heaven. He wants them to be saved. God wants you to be saved more than you want to be saved. God loves you more than you, than, than you could love anybody else or more than anybody else loves you. If you want to know how much God loves you, look at Calvary. Look at the cross. Amen. Just stand and look, think about the cross for a minute and see how much God loved you. If you want to know what God thinks about sin, look at the cross. If you want to see how righteous God is about over sin, look at the cross. If you want to see the wrath of God, look at the cross. If you want to see the holiness of God, just look at the cross. If you want to see the mercy of God, just look at the cross. See, it all, it all, it's all answered at the cross. Every bit of it. So if I just want to know how much God loves Ken Blue, I don't look at Ken Blue. Because when I look at Ken Blue, I think, good night. I don't blame him for not loving me. So what do I do? I look away. And I look at the cross. I say, there's how much he loved me. See? So God is not willing. God doesn't will it. He doesn't desire it that any man or woman should be lost. He desires that everybody would be saved. And if you're not saved, it's not because God doesn't want it. It's either you don't want it or you don't know that he wants you to be saved, one or the other. It may be ignorance, you just don't know about it, or it may be that you love sin and you don't want to be saved. There are many people who don't want to be saved. They love rebellion. They're just rebellious in their heart and they would rather rebel and go to hell than to get saved and have Christ to be their Savior and Lord. They're too proud. They're stubborn. And that's probably the greatest sin. The greatest sin is not those things out here of drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and profanity. Those, those things are wrong and they're bad. But I tell you what the greatest sin is, is your stubbornness and your rebellion. Saying, I won't let God have my life. I'm my own boss. I'm going to do what I want to, you see. And that's, that's really why people are lost. See, God wants you to be saved. Secondly, uh, it is God's will for those who are saved that they have and live a sanctified life. Would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 4? Back to the left, please. These things are pretty, um, or, I'm sorry, it's to the right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, look down at uh, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians uh, 4 and verse 1. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, talking to save people now, and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk, and to please God, so ought you to abound more and more. Now watch verse 3. You want to know the will of God? For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And then you notice it talks about impurity. So when you get saved, God's will is that you are sanctified. That word sanctified means set apart. That's all it means, set apart. Sanctified simply means set apart. If you work in an office somewhere and there's a designated parking place for you, that place has been set aside for you. You could say in a sense it's a sanctified place. It's set apart. That's all the word means. So once you get saved, it's God's will that you sanctify yourself. That is, that you and I set ourselves apart from the world to God. Amen. That's God's will. It's God's will. You understand that? Sure. Sure. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, I just, you know, I think people ought to get saved by my lifestyle. Others say... Oh, uh, and they'll say, I don't think you ought to speak up for the Lord. Let me tell you, uh, you ought to do both. You ought to do both. Your lifestyle ought to be right, and your words ought to be right. Someone said this morning, if Jesus, if people got saved because of lifestyle only, everybody who saw Jesus would have been saved. Why? Nobody. He lived a perfect life. 
It's not just a perfect life that gets people saved. You must open your mouth as well. But if you're not going to live right, you ought not to open your mouth. You'd be sanctified, set apart to God. That's why God saves you. He set you apart to himself so he could take you to heaven. But you're not in heaven. You're down here on this earth in a wicked and a perverse generation, the Bible talks about. And we're to separate ourselves unto him. Yes, sir. Not only that, it's God's will for those who are saved and sanctified that we serve Him. That we serve Him. Now, I can't dictate the nature of that service, what it should be, but let's go back to Romans chapter 12, please. Look at Romans 12 and uh, verse 1. Romans 12, 1. You want to know what the will of God is? I can tell you it's God's will that you get saved. I can tell you it's God's will that if you are saved, that you set yourselves apart unto God be separated from the world. But in chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, talking to saved people again, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. That's sanctification. And then he says, which is your reasonable service? Goes on to say, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the re renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect what? will of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should be saved. God is willing. His will is your sanctification. And then His will is that sanctified people use their bodies for service. Well, this is rather crude and gross, but it'll communicate. When I was a boy growing up in Arkansas, we had wood stoves, we had kerosene lamps, and we had a path. And at the end of the path was a Sears catalog. And some of you couldn't figure that out yet. Bless your heart. You. <laughs> but anyway, what it meant is we didn't have an outhouse. We just had an out. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, those old southern people dipped snooze. Red rooster. How many ever heard of red rooster snooze? Ah, look at there, all these snooze users. Okay. And there's another one called Garrett, called Garrett Snuff. One time when I was a boy, about five years old, I found an empty, about a half of a box of snuff under the porch. And I didn't know what I had, and I opened that thing up. I, mean, I, don't know, I guess I shook it when I opened it, and the powder came up and hit me right in the face. And I thought I was going to die, because that snuff is just powder, you know. And, and so these old southern folks, they put it in their lip down here, you know, fill their lip full of that snooze. And, um, and they usually would carry a coffee can around. Just gets me to think about it. But they'd carry that can around. But sometimes, you know, you'd have this old wood stove and you'd have a pan, like a wash pan, about this big around. And you'd have that right in the front of the stove and you'd drag the ashes. You know, when the stove would get to filling up with ashes, you'd drag the ashes out in this pan. That pan was used for other things. And I'm not, I'm not lying to you. I used to sit as a boy and I would watch my uncle. Now, if you really want to be accurate, you do this, that way. And, uh, you know, you really aim, you know, like a slingshot. And I used to watch those people and they would spit that snooze, uh, spit in that pan in front of the stove. Now, let's just see if I'm the only heathen in this world. Anybody else ever see this besides me? Okay, good. I just want some of you young people to know that that's where Clinton's from down there, see? Anyway. But anyway, <laughs> now, I'm not accusing him of that, you know. But he's more refined than that, but <laughs> maybe. But anyway, that's the way it went. So you would find these spittoons sitting around in places. Sometimes it would just be a coffee can. Sometimes it would be anything you could get a hold of. Sometimes it would be just a wash pan full of ashes in front of a stove. Now, I'm telling you, that was not an uncommon sight in a southern home about in the 40s and 50s. And maybe in some of them now down there. I don't know. See? Now, God says, in a house, there are all kinds of vessels. Some are spittoons. Some are bedpans. Some are milk pails. Some are medical uh, uh, objects. 
But they're all there, and they're used for different things. Now, God says, if a child of God will purge himself and will be a vessel, sanctified, set apart, clean, he will be ready for the master's use. Amen. Now, God is not wanting an old spit tune. That's not what God's wanting. God's not looking for someone who's dirty, is he? Why, you wouldn't if you go out to eat this afternoon. You know what you're going to do? First thing you're going to do, some of you... Some of you, you'll check the prices first. But, but most of you, you're going to pick up the silverware and you're going to look at it. And you're going to look in your cup and, and you're going to check it. And you're going to get a napkin and clean it out, you see. Well, sure you are. Sure you are. And yet, bless God, you expect God to use something dirtier than you would. Right? Right? God expects you and me, when we're saved, to be sanctified. That is, we're to set ourselves apart unto Him. And God says, if you will sanctify yourselves from those unclean vessels, He says, you will be fit for the Master's use. Amen. Yeah. Same. Now, I don't have time to say all, I'm, all I need to say on that, but I've said enough, I guess. Now, let me tell you something else that is the will of God. I've said it's God's will that you get saved. I said that it's God's will that you be sanctified, set apart as a child of God from the world. Now, I don't mean at work that you shouldn't associate with unsaved people. In fact, you should. You can't win lost people to Christ if you don't talk to them. You can't win people if you, if you give this attitude that I can't talk to you because I'm too holy. My point is, is when you talk to people, you shouldn't enter into their worldly talk and their worldly behavior. That's all I'm saying. Otherwise, you're going to have to leave this planet, and that's not God's plan for you yet. God has got you where you are, so you'll be a light for Him. Yeah. A light. But, so He wants you to serve Him. Now, I don't know how God wants you to serve Him. I have no idea. I don't know. I want to help you. If you came to me and said, Pastor Blue, I want to do something for God, I'd probably try to find out what it is you like to do. And I would try to direct you in a particular area. If you like to sing, I'd direct you to the choir. If you love infants, I'd direct you to the nursery. If you love teenagers, I'd direct you to Brother Kelly Backstrom to work with teens. If you love to just serve, I'd probably ask you to talk with a, a Brother Jerry Burdett or somebody about being an usher, helping in that area. See, you love to work with uh, electronics, things like that, I'd ask maybe to work with our sound system and the video equipment, things of that nature. If you like secretarial work, we might find something in that area. I don't know what, if you're a mechanic, we'd put you out in the bus bar and let you work if you really want to. If you really want to be a mechanic, try those buses out there. But anyway, I don't know what it is God wants you to do, but if you could tell me what you think God wants you to do, I can direct you. That's all I can do. But I do know it's God's will that you serve Him. Where and how, I don't, I don't always know that. I also know that it's God's will. Well, I want you to see it. I want you to see it before I mention it. Would you go to 1 Peter 3, back to the right? 1 Peter 3. And this is really important that you see this because I, you hardly ever find a Christian who believes that this is God's will for him. Go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, look down at verse uh, 17. 3.17. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It's interesting there that, uh, that he says that suffering there can be connected with the will of God. We really don't believe that it's God's will that we suffer. We think it's God's will that other people suffer. And if God wants help, we'll help make them suffer. Right? In other words, if we don't like them, we know it's God's will that they suffer. And here am I, Lord, I'll help. Say, I mean, boy, we're good at that. But we never believe it's God's will that we suffer. Would you turn to ch chapter 4, the same book, chapter 4, and uh, look down at about verse 19. 419. Therefore let them that suffer according to the will of God... Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as a faithful creator. Well, well, well. Do you know that it is God's will that you suffer for him? Amen. That's right. It is. It is. It's 
God's will that we suffer for him. And this kind of uh, Christianity that has spawned in, you know, and I don't want to suffer. I really don't. I'm like, I don't want to suffer. But we've had it too good for the last 200 years in America. Well, we've had it too good. And uh, we just have, have not had to suffer for Christ. And that may be the best thing that happens to the body of Christ. It may purge it out. I'm sure it will. I heard about an old woman. She'd been going to church about 100 years. And, and some kids dressed up like the devil. And they, they crawled in the back room and went in. And she was about 80 or 90, you know. And they went over and they were dressed in devil uniforms. And they went to get this old woman. And they were coming after her. And as they came after her, she began to sink down in the chair. And she said, oh, don't hurt me. I've been on your side all the time. <laughs> we might find out whose side we're on if just a little suffering came our way. Because the truth is, you don't know whose side you're on right now. We know whose side we think we're on. Peter had that problem. Lord, though all men forsake you, yet will not I. Oh, yeah? find him a half hour later he's cursing and swearing and saying I don't even know who you're talking about say you don't know yourself Christian until adversity comes in your life then you begin to find out the real person and we fail in those things now listen God's not trying to destroy us in that you know what God's trying to teach you in those things that you need to quit depending on yourself that you need him so God brings you to a place to where you will fail and you cry out to God. Example, Simon Peter. Jesus is going across the sea, walking on the water, and the disciples are rowing, but the wind is contrary. And they see the Lord Jesus. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. He said, come on. So Peter stepped out of the boat. He did better than the rest of them. He stepped out of the boat and began to walk on the water. And he looked back, and this is in the original Greek. He looked back and he said, hey, fellas, look how I'm doing. Down he went. He, sure, he, he, he prayed. I think that guy prayed the quickest, the shortest, and the most sincere prayer in the Bible. <laughs> Lord, save me. Amen. That's what you need. You need to sink every once in a while. And that's what God does. Have you ever tried to hold your kid's hand and they won't let you? You know when they run, they're going to plow the asphalt. But they are so stubborn, they won't let you hold on. I try. Every kid goes through this, you know. And you know, and you watch them run ahead of you, and they're about a year old when this happens, or 15 months. And they're running ahead of you, and you, you can predict it. And it's a nose, and it's a chin, and it's knees, and it's hands. Right into it. You know, you know what they do? Ah! They come screaming back and want you to take them. And you know what you say? Well, that's not what I wanted, but I guess you needed it. Look where you are now. You're right here in my arms. You getting the message? It's not because God doesn't love you. He does love you. But you and I, sometimes, we're just so stubborn and self-willed that God says, well, I think it's my will that you suffer a little bit. Because if you suffer and you respond properly, you know where you'll be? You'll be right back in his arms. I'm telling you, that's the way it works. And that is God's will. But that will is conditional. You may not get in his arms. You may lay there on the asphalt and throw a fit. You may shake your fist at, your, at God. You may get bitter and run away from home. But God's will is that you'd come back to him. That's God's will. Well, preacher, how can I know God's will? Let me just give you three things hurriedly. First of all, you know it by the word of God. By the word. God communicates his will through the Bible. And these people, now you hear me and you hear me good. These people who tell you, God told me. Now listen to this. Let's suppose I go to this guy and I say, Brother, I was in prayer the other day and God told me that he wants you in Mexico. You're planning to go to Ireland, aren't you? That's right. God just told me he wants you to go to Mexico. First of all, God didn't tell me anything. 
Secondly, do you know what that has, that has made me God in this man's life? And it, it's destructive. It's destructive. I've just set him on a course of destruction. I'm telling you, and I'm going to tell you again, you better get this. God doesn't tell anybody to tell you anything. Everything God has told anybody is in the Bible. Amen. It's there. And these people who are playing God and saying, well, God showed me or God revealed to me or God gave me this to tell you. You know what a guy, I say to a guy like that? I say, well, that's really fr confusing because God told me right the opposite. <laughs> I do. I say, God told me right the opposite. One fellow said to Mr. Spurgeon at the Tabernacle in London, a young preacher came up and said, Mr. Spurgeon, God told me to preach in your church. Mr. Spurgeon says, well, when God tells me, I'll let you. Amen. <laughs> and here's what you tell these birds that say God told them. You just respond back and say, no problem. And when God tells me, I'll get back to you. But until then, adios. You know how you know God's will? From the Word of God. Amen. From the Word of God. And these people who play God... Not only that, there's another area that we call it the providence of God. And the providence of God is where God works in circumstances, brings people and things into your life. But that is secondary. The Word of God is primary. And then last of all is by the Holy Spirit. I used to work for the state of Washington I, when I was about 18, 17, 18 right in that area. I worked for a while before I came over here for Boeing. And uh, I worked for a survey crew. I know what those guys are doing out there. Just what I told you. And, uh, but you know, in surveying, in surveying, you have to get things lined up. And when it comes to the will of God about something that is not directly revealed in the Bible, such as things I've mentioned to you this morning, you, there are some stakes that you need to line up. And these stakes will line up. And the first stake that you need to drive is the Word of God. Amen. God is not going to lead you contrary to the Bible. Right. The next stake will have to do with providence or circumstances. And if those circumstances line up with the Word of God, you've got two stakes. Okay? A third stake will be peace in your heart. After much prayer, you know you're right with God, that stake will line up with the other two. Now, if those stakes don't line up, then God is, I would say, is not leading you to make a decision at that point. It may mean to wait on something. It's God's will you get saved. It's God's will that you sanctify yourself as a child of God. It's God's will that you serve Him. It's God's will that you suffer for Him. God's will can be discovered in the Word of God. God's will is um, clarified by the providence of God, the things He brings into your life. And then finally, the Holy Spirit will confirm that these things are so in your life. For instance, this morning, let me show you how it works. The Bible says that God wants you saved, right? There's one, there's the Word of God, right? Two, the providence of God is you're here this morning. You may wonder why, well, why am I in this church? Providence of God. And the third thing is your, as you're in the Holy Spirit says to your heart this morning, he's right, you need to be saved. Yeah. You see how all the stakes are lined up? The Bible says you need to be saved. You're here, the providence of God has put you in that position where you can hear it. And your own spirit, your own heart, the, whole, or the Holy Spirit says to your spirit, that's right, I need Jesus as my Savior. Isn't that right? That is what's going on. That's what's going on. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, thank you this morning.